Welcome to church. We're going to start our service today with a song that is based on Psalm 136. If you have a Bible nearby, you might actually want to open it to Psalm 136 right now and take a look at this awesome psalm. You'll see that the psalm is written in a structure where each line starts with gratitude for a specific attribute or action of God and ends with the refrain, his love endures forever. The first few lines are very big picture, expressing gratitude for God's character and who he is. The psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. But as the psalm goes on, it becomes more personal and specific to the Israelites' experience of God's faithfulness. It says, to him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever, and brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever. And the psalm goes on. Pastor Phil has been teaching us about the practices of Jesus, practices that deepen and grow our faith. And it occurred to me that psalm writing is a pretty cool practice that King David did a lot. So I decided to try writing my own Psalm 136. Today is also Mother's Day, which is a special and often poignant day to celebrate. So I decided to write my version of Psalm 136 in honor of mothers. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. To the God who knit each of us together in our mother's wombs, with all our abilities and disabilities, each of us carefully created in his own image, his love endures forever. To him who gives super strength to new mothers, to adoptive mothers, to foster mothers, as they love and care for a little person who needs a lot from them, his love endures forever. To him who weeps with mothers, as we mourn miscarriage and stillbirth, his love endures forever. To him who waits with mothers to be through the long, painful and uncertain valley of infertility, his love endures forever. To him who is overjoyed with us when a little one says, Mama, for the first time, his love endures forever. To him who tells us that we are good enough, that we are mother enough, when we feel like we are constantly trying and falling short, his love endures forever. To him who hears our anxiety-filled prayers when we worry and worry about our children, to him who brings a supernatural peace to the mothers of teenagers, his love endures forever. To him who grieves with us when our mothers are gone and we mark this day in a new way, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's sing together.
Pastor Phil has been leading us in a series, and last week he talked about our desire to see God's face, both in creation and in being in his word, in scripture, and meditating on it. And this series is all about the practices and the habits that Jesus did, and we want to follow Jesus, so we want to do those practices and habits as well. And so this week, he'll be talking about silence and solitude. So this song that we're going to sing is just going to encourage us to, um, in our daily week, in our life, to, you know, take those times to seek silence and seek those quiet places where we push every hindrance aside and we just focus on him and hear his love and hear his voice because we want to know him more.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Your love is relentless. Lord, you pursue us. You never leave us. Lord, we're like sheep, and you keep searching for us. Thank you, God, for your love. There's nothing you won't do to get our attention. And we just say, have your way with us, Lord. Lord, I pray that every person here today would know your kindness and your overwhelming love your relentless love. God, we thank you. Let us hear that today. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, church. I'm Christy, the Director of Children's Ministry here at Clearview Church. This morning, I'd like to share some announcements with you. First, coming up is 10 days of prayer. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he called his disciples to wait and to pray for God's power through the Holy Spirit. The 10 days between Ascension Day and Pentecost are traditionally days of concerted prayer for the Church of Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us starting on May the 13th, Ascension Day, for 10 days of prayer, starting at 7 a.m. on Zoom. We are going to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our communities, friends, families, neighbors, children, youth, co-workers, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on people who don't yet know and love God. So join us, we pray, for these 10 days. For more information, please feel free to check out the e-news, which will give you information because there's going to be a daily email with scripture, a prayer guide, and a worship playlist. We do hope you join us for these 10 days of prayer. Second, there will be no youth group tonight due to Mother's Day. However, youth have the opportunity to enjoy classes of profession of faith and baptism next Sunday from 1130 to 1230. Third, there will be children's ministry this Sunday at 1145 and at 130 p.m. If you'd like to register your children, please feel free to contact me. You can email me, Christy at clearviewchurch.com and I'll get you registered and all set up. Talking about kids, kids, right now, this is a little time just for you. Kids, do you like to feel heard? Do you like it when someone listens to you? Do you like it when a parent 
listens to you and hears what you have to say, I know I like to feel listened to. And you know what? God likes it when we listen to him too. It's true. It's all part of running the race of faith that Paul talks about in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews. We touched on this last week. Paul says in Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. One way to run the race of faith and to fix our eyes on Jesus is by hearing from and listening to God. How do we hear from God? One way we can hear from God is reading the Bible. So I challenge us this week, everybody, including myself, I challenge you kids, let's read the Bible together this week with our families, our friends at home. When I say together, it just know that we'll all be reading it this week. Let's read Luke chapter 11, verses one to four. It's the Lord's Prayer. Let's read about the Lord's Prayer together and hear from God and hear his words for us. Next week in Kids Ministry on Zoom, we're going to be talking about the Lord's Prayer. So come prepared, having read your scripture beforehand. And if you're not going to come to Zoom Ministry next Sunday, that's okay. Feel free to go ahead and read it anyways with a family member or maybe a sibling at home. And enjoy hearing from God and His Word. Do you know that the Bible is literally called the Word of God? And God loves it when we read the Bible and we have an opportunity to hear the words of God to us. Now we're going to enjoy a small video clip talking about running the race of faith and hearing from and listening to God. When you're training for a race, you need to learn how to hear what's around you. When you're training for life, hearing is a lot more than just taking in some sounds. You need to learn how to hear from God. How do you do that? How do you hear from someone who can seem big and far away? Hello? Here's what's cool. God is big, it's true, but he isn't far away. His son Jesus made it possible for us to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. And God gave us a way to hear from him anytime we want. This book, the Bible, is filled with the words of God written down by many different people over hundreds of years. Reading the Bible is one of the best ways to discover what's true and important. It can help you know God better and it can help you see if there's something in your life that you need to change. You can hear from God like this, like this, or like this. You can hear from God through songs, through other people, maybe even in nature. Ah! Yeah, be careful in nature. So, practice hearing from God. Read your Bible or have someone read it to you. If you don't have a Bible or if you have questions about what you should read, ask a small group leader or someone you trust. They'll be excited to help you build your training plan to hear from God. So, here's the one thing to remember today. Practice hearing from God. When you practice listening to God's words, it can help you discover what it looks like to love God and love others each day. I hope that's training you all can bear. Point <gasps> 19 seconds! That's gotta be some kind of record. See you next time. Oh wait, that's not what that's. Like. Good morning. Today, we celebrate Mother's Day. Typically, Clearview uses the Mother's Day offering to support World Renews maternal and child health programs around the world. Every year, hundreds of thousands of women die during pregnancy or childbirth, and nearly nine million children die before ever reaching the age of five. Many of these deaths occur in countries where clean, safe water, a toilet, the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables, and education are a challenge. Many of these deaths can be prevented through community-based health promotion, education, and nutrition programs. World Renews Maternal and Child Health Program, providing support for mothers during pregnancy and for the first five years of a child's life, is an important part of the community development work in many of the countries where they have a presence. 
One of the areas where World Renew has been implementing maternal and child health projects is in Jharkhand state in eastern India. Not surprising, this is the same area in India where World Renew is now also focusing its relief response for COVID-19. As you have heard and seen on TV, India is facing a dramatic surge in COVID-19 cases that is claiming lives at an alarming rate and leaving vulnerable families in crises. Hospitals are overwhelmed with a severe shortage of beds, oxygen, PPEs, and medical supplies. Every day since April the 25th, India has reported over 350,000 daily new cases. The death rate is now over 3,000 people every single day. 20% of India's people live in extreme hunger. People are struggling to feed their families and protect their health during this pandemic. In fear of the overcrowded cities, there is a vast migrant exodus from urban areas to rural communities. With such a vast movement of people, COVID-19 is spreading quickly into small villages that have even fewer resources to cope with the high rates of COVID-19 infections. Today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, in light of the crises in India, I'm thankful that Clearview thought it appropriate to focus our offering efforts on all of World Renew's projects in India, not just in the area of maternal and child health, but also in the broader context of its COVID-19 response there. World Renew is working alongside its local partner, Efficor, to provide much needed hygiene kits to vulnerable families in a rural area in the state of Jharkhand, as well as financial assistance to families to help meet their immediate needs, including food and medicines. In addition to meeting the needs of these households, they will also be supporting a local healthcare facility serving these communities. Right now, I'd like to share with you a short video from Kuki Rokum. Kuki is a staff member at Efficor. The situation that we're living in is a situation of anxiety, stress, of death, of illness, of desperation. Every morning when I look at my phone, I dread opening the messages because there's always someone needing something or I get a message of someone who's lost a dear one or a colleague who is sick or another one who has tested positive. So it's just, uh, we're living in really, really difficult and desperate times. World Renew for Efficor to be a blessing to these people so that people in this desperate situation can still have hope. And I think we can bring that hope by saying, here is a little help. You know, we can't give you support for a lifetime, but here is a little help that will help you go through the most difficult period that you're facing. World right. Renew's ability to scale up and meet this crisis is directly linked to the generosity of donors like you and me. Please help us bring the love of God directly to those who feel trapped and afraid during this health crisis. I assure you that your gift will change lives. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew DeMoss, and I was asked to provide a faith story for one of our online church services. I quickly said yes, thinking that it would be fairly easy to do, but when I sat down to write something, I found it difficult to come up with an inspiring testimony. Reflecting on the past year, however, has really been a blessing and um, very humbling as God's provision for us and blessings on us um, stood out very clearly. So here it goes. As most of you probably know, I have MS or multiple sclerosis, which I've described as a steady downward but very shallow slide. I've been blessed that it progresses slowly so that I'm still able to work full time. The house we were living in, which we loved, uh, needed a fair amount of upkeep, which was becoming more and more difficult for me to contribute to. We kept feeling as though it was time for us to find a different place. One that didn't need as much maintenance and one that is more accessible for me. There's a much longer story to tell, but the summary is that God carved out a path for us to travel. And in late August of last year, we moved to a maintenance-free condo townhome in Burlington, which also has an elevator. We were blessed by God, providing clarity every step of the way, and by friends and churchmates who helped us with painting, cleaning, and moving. 
Isolation during the COVID lockdowns and stay-at-home orders has been difficult. I've been feeling quite disconnected, and to be brutally honest, I've been uh, feeling my heart is becoming somewhat hardened. It's been hard, and it's been a struggle. So Easter is the best time for me to be reminded that God sent his son to die for us and that he was resurrected. What an amazing reminder that even in the struggle, we have hope and we can find joy in the new life that comes with Christ's resurrection. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing your hope with us your desire to see the Lord heal, your commitment to him, no matter what his desire is for you and Evelyn at this time, how the Lord has provided for you and your family as you prepare for what may ahead, what may lie ahead. Good morning. My name is Abe Coop. Debbie and I have been at Clearview for six years now. And um, this is our family, and um, I'd like to lead you in prayer. Father, nothing is impossible for the one who holds the universe in his hands. Your decisions have always been faithful for your glory and for our good. And so we trust you for your work in Andrew and his family. Father, we pray for each member of our church, from the toddlers on to the grandpas and grandmas. Lord, cleanse us from fear. The psalmist gave thanks that you freed them from their fears, and so we too give you our fears. Thank you, Spirit of God, that you are with us in our present situation. Whether it's COVID, isolation, financial or health concerns, so much is out of our hands and so much is in yours. And so we give our cares to you because you care for us. Jesus, you promised Rest for those who are weary, who carry burdens. And so we give our concerns to you for our families, for our children, for our grandchildren. Oh God, we long to see them choose you, choose to follow you. And Lord Jesus, we ask you to be near the teachers and students. Um, as they work with online learning. We pray for our first responders, the health workers. We are concerned with all the variants of COVID and the way they are causing havoc here in Canada and around the world. Father, give wisdom to those who are making decisions. We give to you our world, and with all of its troubles, its wars, injustices, diseases, and disasters. Thank you that you are in charge. Father, we give you thanks that you took Bethany to Guatemala to help there. Thank you for her testimony. She's a bright light to the students and the staff. Meet her every need and grow her faith, Lord. Please guide the Vergara family as they seek committed volunteers to help them serve the church in Columbia. We give thanks for what they are learning in their master's program. And we pray for them, Lord, for Colombia, We pray for your peace for that land. Lord, how we, how we want to honor the nations that were here before us, 
whose land we live on? How do we undo the harm our ancestors did to them, to their children, to their language and culture? Father, we need your wisdom. Lord Jesus, you told us to come boldly to your throne of grace, where we would find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so we come asking you, asking for our world, asking for our Muslim friends who are celebrating Ramadan and wanting to catch a vision of you. Please reveal yourself to them, Lord Jesus. For those who are still waiting for the word of God in their own language, we ask you to provide a translation that they will truly understand. Lord Jesus, you asked us to pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's our prayer. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elisha, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have torn down, have rejected your covenant, covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimishi king over Israel, and anoint Elisha son of Saphet from Abel Meholah to secede you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouth have not kissed him. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Clearview Church. So good to welcome you to church today. Wherever you are streaming this from and wherever you are on your journey with Jesus, we want to say we're glad to have you here. Welcome. Before we get going to the sermon this morning, I want to just take a minute to encourage every one of you to participate in our 10 Days of Prayer initiative. You know, when Jesus ascended to heaven, before he did that, he called his disciples and he said, stay in Jerusalem, pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And so the church has regularly set aside those days from Ascension Day to Pentecost Sunday when the Holy Spirit came. Those 10 days, uh, the church has set aside as days dedicated to prayer. And this year, we are calling Clearview Church to dedicate ourselves to those 10 days of pray, to pray wherever you are, however you can, every day for God to send his Holy Spirit, for God to embolden us as his witnesses. And we're asking you to pray for five different people you know so that they might come to know the living, risen Jesus Christ. We've prepared a prayer guide that'll help you pray through each day. It's got it prayer activities for you. And then we're hosting a prayer Zoom time every morning for those 10 days, starting at, I know, 7 a.m. It's going to be okay. You know what? Because it's Zoom. All you got to do is roll out of bed, 
join in the prayer time. So not a problem. Just put some clothes on before you do that. And we're going to pray together. We're going to ask for God's spirit to renew us every morning, 7 a.m. It's going to be led by a different person. And we welcome you to that. But again, wherever you are, however you can, whenever you can, we're asking, let's come together in prayer. Now, we're going to shift and talk about some of the practices of Jesus. But as we reflect on that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Join me, would you? Father, we believe that you inspired by your Holy Spirit the word, the text we read today. And we're asking now that your spirit would continue to do work to open up our ears so that we can hear your living voice and then open up our hearts so that we might live out this word that we hear today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a really loud, a noisy world. Increasingly, we are losing any sense of quiet space. There are conservation groups that are dedicated to actually preserving the few remaining quiet spaces on the face of the earth. Because the reality is we're constantly interrupted by noise, overhead planes, leaf blowers, traffic, buses, trains, construction vehicles, emergency vehicles, sirens. Over and over, there's so much clamor and noise in our modern life. But even more so is what someone has called the great electronic din. The emails, the texts, podcasts, pings, beeps, vibrations that constantly vie for our attention. I think when the history books are written, 2007 is going to be noted as one of the more important years in world history, probably right up there with 1440. If you know a little history, 1440 was when it was the year that the Gutenberg uh, press was invented. That was an invention that revolutionized the world. So what happened in 2007? That was the year that the iPhone was first released. Interestingly, that was also the year when Facebook moved from just a private university website to something that was open to all people. And it was also the year when this strangely named new social media platform called Twitter came into its own. That was probably the unofficial start of the digital age. And all these digital technologies and media have created what some are calling the attention economy which is a world where people are constantly clamoring for our attention, where our attention is the commodity that people seek out. And so in that attention economy, highly paid attention architects develop tons of thousands of apps that are specifically designed to hold your attention, to distract you almost every minute of the day. We live in what one writer has called a state of continual partial attention. He means that our focus is continuous, but it's always shifting. It shifts from one thing to another, to multiple things, so that we never settle on, we never focus in on any one thing for very long, creating this systemic distraction culture. Now, don't take all this to mean I am a hater of technology. I love technology. I'm so glad for what my computer can do. I am so thankful for my iPhone. But at the same time, I think we can name that all this technology is shaping us, and we probably need to name how it's malforming us, how it's damaging us. One writer, Andrew Sullivan, wrote a really remarkable article, and it was uh, called, it was titled, I Used to Be a Human Being. And in that article, he describes how he was relentlessly living his life online. He was an author of a pretty prolific blog. He was on all social media channels, but he knew that somehow he was becoming less in the process. And so what he did is he admitted himself to a digital detox center. I didn't even know they had such things, but he did. And at the end of the article that he wrote about this experience, he writes this. He says, there are books to be read, landscapes to be walked, friends to be with, life to be fully lived. This new epidemic of distraction is our civilization's specific weakness. And its threat, he says, is not so much to our minds, even as they shape shift under the pressure. The threat is to our souls. 
And he concludes this. He says, at this rate, if the noise does not relent, we might even forget we have any. Not that we lose our souls, but that we forget we are people with a soul. We're in a messages, a series of messages on the practices of Jesus. And if you've missed any, um, I'd encourage you just to catch up to review some of the earlier ones because they provide some really important foundational understandings for how practices function. And you can find them on the Clearview Church YouTube channel. But as we think about distraction and all the noise and the practices of Jesus, you think, is there a practice then from the life of Jesus that can help us thrive in this modern society of noise and distraction. Well, happy to say, yes, there is. It is the practice of silence and solitude. This ancient practice helps us thrive in our modern world of technology. So what are these practices of silence and solitude? Today, I want to focus mostly on silence because I think the practice of solitude is pretty much baked into the practices of silence. So if you're practicing silence, you're probably already alone and uh, on your own. But simply put, silence is the practice of intentional time listening to God in quiet, without interruption, and with minimal noise and distraction. Again, silence is simply the practice of very intentionally setting aside time to listen to God in quiet, without interruption, with minimal noise. You don't listen to music. You don't take a book along to read in the quiet. You shut down the TV. You put away your phone. You refrain from yourself talking. And you pay attention to God. We live in such a noisy, distracted world where listening for the voice of God is becoming a lost skill. But that skill sits at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, the capacity to listen to God. And it's a skill we see Jesus doing often. It's a practice we see Jesus repeating. You look at the life of Jesus, and it wasn't a slow, dull life. It was full. It was busy. And yet, throughout that busy, full life, which is a life we often experience, Jesus would regularly pull away from all the crowds. He would withdraw from the busyness very intentionally. He would pull away from the rhythms of regular life to go to solitary places for quiet and prayer. For instance, Mark 1, verse 35, we read, very early in the morning, it was still dark out, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Or Luke 5, where we read news about Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So Jesus would go out to what the Bible calls these lonely places, a a quiet place simply to be by himself with his Father. Now, why would you do that? Because this was for replenishment. The desert places, the lonely places, were places and times where where Jesus was strengthened. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? Before that, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. He was fasting, praying, 40 days of silence and solitude. And you think, my goodness, after those 40 days, he must have been just so weak, so depleted. But on the contrary, Jesus was never more stronger, more filled up in silence, in hearing God's voice. Jesus came to a place of strength, of being filled up, out of which then he could minister and serve. And over and over again, we see Jesus coming back to this practice of withdrawing for silence and solitude, to be filled up. And it's that dynamic that I think is really critical to understanding the practice of silence. Silence is not about just emptying yourself. A lot of people might think of the practice as that way, and they, and they practice it that way. But the aim of silence is not to empty yourself. It's not simply to get rid of all the noise in life. Because if that's the issue, you know, I understand Bose has a pretty good set of ear can- noise-canceling headphones. So just get one of those. But no, the aim of silence is to listen. To become fully awake and present to the dynamic and living presence of God. 
So silence is less about the absence of something and more about filling ourselves with the presence of God, opening ourselves to become attentive to the God who is always there. Now, we mostly think that God, being who God is, I mean, he should be able to grab our attention, right? He should reveal himself in a loud voice, should maybe get more obvious with us. But we've misunderstood God because this is not God's way. Look at the story of Elijah that we heard read today. The Hebrew prophet Elijah, he was a man whose heart was set on God. And he has been going and going, following God, serving God. But in this story, he's just come at the end of his rope. In fact, he doesn't even know if he wants to go on with life. He's, he's like, God, I want, I want out. I don't want to live this life any longer. But God says, Elijah, hang on, go up to the mountain because I'll meet you there. And so Elijah flees to the mountains, and once in the mountains, he finds a cave, and he's thinking, okay, maybe God's going to speak to me here. And God would, but not in a way Elijah expected. And as Elijah waited, this great storm billowed up around the mountain, and a hurricane winds just shook the mountains to its depth, groaning under the howling winds. But Elijah knew this was not the Lord. God was not in the fierce wind. And then there came an earthquake where the rocks started falling and the stone walls of his cave started shaking and the foundations of the earth seemed to be giving way. But this too was not the Lord. God was not in the earthquake. And then came a forest fire, this blaze that engulfed all the trees on the hills. And he watched this fire race up the mountain, surrounding his cave with smoke and ash. This too, this wasn't God. And then in the night, after the fire and after the earthquake, after the storm, there came this small, fragile, eternal silence. Some translations have it, a still, small voice. Some translations have it, a quiet whisper. And God was in the quiet whisper. Now, there's all sorts of discussion about what that word, quiet whisper, or still small voice means. Many scholars believe that it doesn't even refer to a sound that you could hear, not an audible sound for your ears. And so some translate that this was God, that God was in the sound of silence. God wasn't in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. God was in the silence. Silence is a rare experience in our lives. And even for those who live alone. And so for a few moments, I want to invite you right now into a guided experience of silence. It's going to last for about five to six minutes. You're going to see words on the screen that are going to guide you through this. But right now, as best as you can, quiet the room around you. Still your body. Get in a comfortable position. And give your attention to the words on the screen. And experience silence.
the aim in the practice of silence, and I hope that went well for you, the aim in the practice of silence and solitude is always to grow a listening life. Without a listening heart, you have not practiced silence. You know, you, a person can live alone, but never enter into the meaning of silence. The practice of silence is to grow our ability to listen, to hear the voice of God. It's interesting, the word listen occurs over 1,500 times throughout Scripture. That's a pretty pronounced use of the word listen. Why? Because it is God's voice that brings life. It was the voice of God that spoke and created this world. It's the voice of God that brings salvation and healing and joy. It's what we're meant to know. That voice is what changes and transforms us. And it was silence that led Elijah to hear God's call. It's interesting. Silence and solitude, you know, they're never escapes from the world. They are necessary withdrawals, but they equip us and send us back into the world, strengthened as God's people. And Elijah, as he's quiet, as he hears this gentle whisper of God's voice, and in that quiet, he hears God's call to go. So in and through silence, we find God's strength to move out into the world with a greater compassion, with a strengthened love, so that we might serve others. We listen in silence to live in communion with God. When we're noisy and busy, we're, we're really incapable of intimacy. Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. You know, that word know, be still and know that I'm God, it has very intimate connotations, sexual connotations, actually. It's a word that's used of speaking of the intimacy of a husband and wife, of two people vulnerably opening themselves to one another. Because the best knowing, the best knowledge we have is not information, but it's communion. Be still, Scripture tells us. Be quiet. Open yourself so that you might know God, so that you might experience communion. But to know this communion, we need to find quiet. And if you have any experience with silence, you know that a vital part of practicing silence is learning to quiet all the internal noise within us, all the voices that are going on inside our heads. In each of our heads and our hearts, there. There's like a soundtrack going on, isn't there? A soundtrack of judgment and comparison. It's often one of ridicule or fear. There, it's these voices of shame and self-rejection. I, I, all the people I talk to, I mean, we hear this soundtrack incessantly. I've experienced it. I once went on a silent retreat. And it wasn't just one day. It was eight days of silence. I know, crazy, right? I don't know what I was thinking at the time. But it turns out it was actually one of the most life-giving, spiritually transformative experiences of my life. But it wasn't easy, I got to tell you. Because the trouble with turning down the volume on my mouth is that every other sound seems just cranked right up. I remember there being a woman upstairs in, of the room that I was sitting. Women and men were on, housed on different floors, so I knew as a woman. She was making a lot of noise up in her room, and she was helped out by a squeaky floor, and it sounded like she was just running lamps in her room, just above my room. And I found myself, I gotta tell you, thinking really bad thoughts about her. Silence revealed this really ugly, judgy underbelly in me. And here I am, you know, in this silent retreat, trying to get in touch with God, and I'm thinking these unholy things about the pacing lady upstairs. And then I'm remembering about some other guy. You know, we would eat dinners in silence, and I see this other guy, and I disliked him already. And I thought, why? He hasn't done or said a thing. And what was wrong, of course, was not him, but it was me. The practice of silence will uncover the soundtrack that goes on inside of us. All those internal voices that have gone on so long that many of us hardly know it anymore. It's almost like the white background noise to our lives. And so when we're quiet for a bit, many people can find it difficult for the first time. Because when we stop and when we get quiet, all sorts of junk 
gets raised to the surface. It's, it's a little like frost heave. Silence is the frost heave of the soul. You know what frost heave is, right? In the cold of winter, the earth, it contracts and it regularly pushes up to the surface rocks and stones. And silence has that same sort of habit, lifting the subterranean rubble of our souls to the surface of our lives that then we need to confess and clear out. And I think so no wonder we fill our noise with our lives with all sorts of noise and busyness because we mostly don't want to deal with that junk. But this is part of the healing of this practice as well. So much noise, so much distraction, so many voices that seek to define us, telling us who we are, what we're to do. But the only voice we so desperately need is the voice of love the voice of God that helps us deal with all that junk that's in us. And this makes silence a beautiful invitation to experience the gospel. The practice of silence is actually an embodied way to experience the gospel. Because think of it, in the practice of silence, we don't do anything, do we? We do nothing but open ourselves to God's presence, to his voice of love. We do nothing. We're not productive. We don't perform for God. We don't impress God with mighty acts of service. We don't persuade or cajole God to like us. We're not doing all sorts of good things. And this is so hard because we're trained to make our way in the world by performance. By what we say, by what we do, we try to prove ourselves, right? We're so groomed to define ourselves to construct a sense of self by our action, by our activity, by our words, by the positions we hold. And all of this gives a sense of self, of who we are. But to be silent, to quiet and still without any action to justify our existence, without any words to defend or define ourselves, that feels vulnerable. It feels naked before God. I'm convinced all our words and all our busyness and noise are, are sort of like fig leaves that we use to hide and cover up before God. And silence and solitude are so difficult because we've bought into the lie that we need to prove ourselves, that we need to manufacture some identity, that we need to create our significance by how well we perform. That's who we are. But in silence, we're called to simply be before God to simply enjoy his love for us. Isn't this a gospel posture? To come with empty hands and to receive from God. I think this is the good news of Jesus, that there is nothing we can do to earn or win God's favor and love and goodness. On the cross, in the death of Jesus, God accomplished for us our salvation, our healing, and the acceptance of God, his forgiveness and salvation, this new identity in Jesus comes to us as a gift just to be received. There's nothing for us to do but receive it, to receive our identity that we are God's beloved, that you and I are the cherished children of God. So quiet yourself. Still down all the activity, the striving, and simply receive that gift. And so with the psalmist, we say, my soul alone waits in silence for my hope is in him. This practice is the gospel in a bodily way. It's the invitation for us to know the love of God. And followers of Jesus have been doing this for centuries. And I really do think this may be one of the most important practices of Jesus for us because it is so countercultural in our digital age of distraction. But here's what I bet. I bet many of you right now are thinking, <laughs> you're a little crazy, Phil. You're dreaming. I can't do this. You don't know how busy my life is. I have a three-year-old in my house. My schedule is way too demanding. I can't stop my frantic mind. And I hear that. I get it. But you can do this. You can do this. Here, start with what you can, not with what you can't, okay? Okay. Don't try for a whole weekend of silence, not even a day of silence. Maybe it's just five minutes of silence, of stillness. Ten minutes of silence, of stillness. 
Remember, this is about practice, right? It's not about performing for God or for others, but about practicing, about learning and growing the skills of listening for God. So what can you do? Here's what I think is really important. Identify a time and a place for you that works well. One that's quiet, that is is as distraction-free as possible. And you know what? If you've got a busy house, probably the best place might be a closet or your bathroom. Seriously, you can lock the bathroom door. No one's going to bother you. They might knock on the door, but tell them, go away. Put away your phone, put away other distractions, settle into your time, your place, and get comfortable. And maybe begin by paying attention to your breathing. You could simply repeat a simple phrase like, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Or think of the prayer we were led in last Sunday by Carol von Ravenstein. Beautiful breath prayer. Use that to quiet yourself. And then be still. Enjoy communion with God. Listen for him. Welcome his love, his joy, his presence. For me, one of the ways I practice this is, first thing, before everyone else in the house gets up, it's quiet in the house, which I love, and I brew a really strong cup of coffee. And for the time it takes me to drink that cup of coffee, that's my time of silence. It's my morning coffee with the Trinity. But for others of you, maybe sitting still feels like beyond you. Maybe you've got a really kinesthetic type of body makeup and, okay, you might need to do this while taking a walk in the park by yourself. Or maybe you're knitting, your hands got to keep going, but the rest of you can be still. Start with what you can do. And then as you take that time of silence, however long it is, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes longer, Close your time of silence with a simple prayer of gratitude for God's presence with you. Remember, you you can't succeed or fail at this practice. All you can do is show up. Really, all you can do is show up. So be patient with yourself. This takes some people years to master. So resist the urge to say, oh, I'm just bad at this or this isn't for me. Again, no, you can do this. It's just going to take time. We've been groomed by our culture to be so distracted. So to counter that, it's going to take some unlearning. So don't judge yourself, especially if you're the overachiever type. And I can't encourage you enough. Just start this practice of silence. And, you know, I think maybe the best takeaway is going to be the simplest and sweetest is in your times of silence, you will have experienced the knowledge that Jesus lives in you, with you, and you will hear his voice of love. And I don't think there's a better gift than that. Be still
Friends, as we head into a week where there's going to be lots of distraction, lots of noise, phones pinging, buzzing away, calling for our attention, know that the most important thing you can give your attention to is God's voice of love for you. Take this blessing with you as you go. God, go before you to lead you. God, go behind you to protect you. God, go beneath you to support you. God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid, friends. May the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.